listening to a secret trial, a secret trial. And so if you will, take your Bibles and open them with me to the book of Matthew. Let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 26 this evening. And uh, this evening we're going to be, as I said, looking at a, a trial, but not just one trial, three trials, three amazing trials is the title of the message uh, this evening. And uh, I hope that, I hope that uh, it, it'll be interesting to you. It's a little bit different for me this evening because I'm going to be uh, preaching with, some, uh, with the help of some, some pictures and uh, some props. And so I know Brother Rog has used this whiteboard once in his preaching before, but I've never done this before, so hopefully I can keep it all straight. But uh, we pray that uh, it'll just help it to be a bit more memorable for you this evening. Well, I like uh, before we look at, at these amaze, three amazing trials together this evening, I'd like to read the scripture here from, from Matthew chapter 26, begin reading in verse number 1. Matthew chapter 26. It says in verse number 1, And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. This is probably about the seventh time he's told us like this as recorded in the scripture. Verse 3, Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. Skip down, if you will now, in the same chapter, to verse number 47. Verse 47. <coughs> it says, And while they yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with a great multitude, uh, with, and with him a great multitude, with swords and staves from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, Wherefore art thou come? Then came they, and laid hands on Jesus, and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand, and drew his sword, and struck a servant of the high priests, and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father? And he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that thus it must be? In that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves? For to me I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. And they that laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. <coughs> but Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants <coughs> to see the end. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but none, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses, and said, This fellow <coughs> said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? And Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou 
Tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said. Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold now, ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Then did they spit in his face, and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? Now, trials in the Bible are something that that have always fascinated people. Uh, maybe you've seen trials on television, the the uh, the the, the uh, dramas, the the courtroom dramas, and the trials of famous people on television. But one of the most highly unusual trials that has ever happened, that has ever occurred in the history of the world, uh, was the trial of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what's the object of a trial? The object of a trial in a courtroom is supposed to be. Uh, coming to a, a, a verdict, a fair verdict, a just verdict, and uh, ha both sides able to, to have an opportunity to state their case in an open courtroom setting before a, a judge who is impartial. That's the goal of a trial, an, Im an impartial judge. The judge's job is to pass sentence then if the person's found guilty. That's the judge's job. But the Savior, the trial of our Savior was a shockingly unfair, amazingly unfair trial. And we'll see that in it tonight. Why was it so shocking? Well, before we get to the trial, we have to look at the, the arrest. We've just read about it here in the Scripture. The Bible tells us that Jesus was arrested under the cover of darkness here in Matthew chapter 28. Uh, Matthew chapter uh, 26. And so then the Bible tells us that uh, uh, he asked them, you, you could have arrested me any time. The Lord Jesus Christ, he had come into Jerusalem just days before with great fanfare. Great fanfare. He had come uh, to that wonderful city that had been expecting and waiting for him for 2,000 years. For four, well, for 4,000 years since the Garden of Eden, but 2,000 years before. Abraham, on that very mountain in Jerusalem, Mount Moriah, where the temple now was, now was sitting, Abraham had offered Isaac, and Jesus, and uh, of course Isaac uh, uh, had not been killed, but uh, a, lamb, a, a ram was caught in the thicket to take his place. And that was a one of the most beautiful pictures in the Bible of the Messiah who was going to come to that very same place and be the lamb which takes away the sins of the world. On that same spot, uh, Year, many years, about a thousand years before this, two thousand years before Abraham had been there, a thousand years before that, David had been there, and David had built, or David had uh, been given the spot by an angel during the during the the, the great slaughter uh, by the angel in the city of Jerusalem. He'd been given the exact spot where he was to build the, the temple, where his son Solomon was to build the temple, and on that spot, lamb after the blood and uh, blood of lamb after lamb after lamb had been shed. And so Israel had been waiting for all these years for the final, finally the Lamb, the Messiah, to come into their city. And here he's come, just days before. And then 500 years before, Zechariah had prophesied, hadn't he, that the Messiah was going to come lowly, riding upon an ass, and the, in the foal of an ass, and, uh, and he would come just in that specific way. And so now 500 years later, here it was happening, just days before this, he had come in, and the whole city was excited about him being there. And uh, the anticipation was there. And so the, the priests, they, and then immediately after Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem, he went into the temple. He cleansed it, and then he began teaching in the temple. He taught about so many things. He taught, he taught about uh, his, his future coming. And then after that, he, he went up to the top of the city, looked over Jerusalem, and cried over Jerusalem, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often have I have gathered you together as a hen doth her chicks, but ye would not. And so he, then he spent the next several days teaching, teaching people in the temple about 
parables about his future coming. And yet, he said, all that time that I was in the open, you could have uh, arrested me then, but these authorities were so cowardly that they, that they, uh, they knew that the public opinion was in support of the Lord Jesus, and they would never allow them to hunt down this, uh, this good person, such a good person, in the daylight, and so they come cowardly and arrested him at night. They had paid, they had to pay one of his disciples, the traitor Judas, to give away the master's location, as we read, at night with a kiss. And if you'll turn with me to the book of John, chapter 18, we read here about how, uh, how they had sent so many people in Matthew, but let's, let's read also in John, John chapter 18, it tells us, that they didn't need all these weapons. Jesus and Matthew had said he could have called 10,000 or a whole legion of angels to come and rescue him. But look here at uh, verse number 2 of chapter 18 of John. It says, And Judas also which betrayed him knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. So a whole band of men, hundreds of men, the Bible tells us elsewhere, came. And then it says, Jesus therefore, know, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth. He met them and said unto them, Whom seek ye? And, and they answered him, Je uh, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also which betrayed him stood with them. As soon then... As he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then answered he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let the, these go their way. And so the Bible tells us here that the Lord Jesus Christ had such great power, just with one word, he made them all fall backwards. All these hundreds of soldiers that had come to arrest him, he could have easily walked away. And yet he knew that he must allow himself to be taken and treated just as he would be in this trial uh, for our sakes. For our sakes. He was, he was unjustly treated, but he did. Now, some, one interesting thing about the landscape is that in that garden... If you, uh, if you, well, this is something we'll, we'll learn a little bit about in our Bible uh, geography and life of Christ class on Monday nights, but he could have seen the soldiers coming. If you stand in the Garden of Gethsemane, you can see the gate of Jerusalem, and you, he would have been able to see this, these hundreds of men coming with torches and knives and swords, and yet he stood and waited for them, and he went out to meet them. He could have walked away, but he didn't. But the Bible says uh, that he was then taken to this trial. And uh, the, tri the, the first trial that you, that the, of these three amazing trials was the Jewish trial of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Jewish trial. And there, uh, this, this Jewish trial was going to be take, taking place in two parts. It was held at the dead of night. The time was in the middle of the night. It was uh, before daybreak. So... Early in the morning was the time of this, of this secret trial before the break of day. And the proceedings were all over before the public even realized what was happening. It was, it was a secret trial. And uh, it's shocking, isn't it? Could you ever imagine a trial happening like that? Happening in the middle of the night uh, where, where nobody could be in the public gallery Nobody could be witnessing it. It, it, was a, it was shocking the time of the trial. Uh, also what was shocking was the, uh, the verdict. The verdict of the trial was determined before the trial began. The verdict was guilty for this first trial. Now, uh, it's funny that the, the trial came before the charge. <laughs> they, they had to come up with a charge. They hadn't come up with that yet. But they'd already decided on the verdict. That's supposed to be usually the last thing that happens. But it was the first thing in their minds. You see, these men, 
they had, uh, for a long time, they had been trying to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. Look with me, if you will, at chapter 11 of the book of John. John chapter 11, verse 47. This is really one of the last attempts that the, the uh, this is the final determination that they that they're going to come up with that they're going to start plotting, but look at it, many things that led up to this. But it says in verse forty seven, then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council, and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place. <coughs> And nation. Do you see the word our? They're worried that the Romans would take away our place and nation. Remember, in the Old Testament, whose nation is it? It's God's nation. He says, This is, you are my people, but now they have set themselves up in God's position and in the religious position, an empty religion. Verse 49 And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one should die for the people, that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but rather, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And not for that nation only, but that he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth they took counsel together, for to put him to death. So that was their final. They'd been trying to put him to death for years. They didn't have a. They didn't have any any charges. They just determined they have to put him to death because he's going to mess with our setup. This, they, this was a this was a fixed trial, uh, and that now at last he's in their custody. They've got him, and the trial was going to happen no matter what. These two hearings, though, they were just going to be formalities because they'd already figured out what was going to happen. Now, who was the judge? The judge is the same man that we read about here in, uh, in John chapter 11, verse 49. He's a man named Caiaphas. So here's the judge, the two judges, Annas and Caiaphas the, in the two-part trial. So there, there's the two judges. Now, first, the Lord was taken to Annas. He was a former high priest. He was the father-in-law to the current high priest, Caiaphas. And um, Annas, he, he was really the one behind the scenes. He's, he had proposed his killing in another chapter, in, in Luke chapter 10. Annas was the one who had proposed that Jesus be killed. Do you think that he's an impartial judge? <laughs> no, he wasn't at all. He doesn't sound impartial whatsoever. How shocking is that? So somebody who wants the the defendant dead. Now, the defendant, the one in the in the 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 one who's accused is the Lord Jesus Christ. So, they'd already said he was guilty. The judge wanted him dead. Let's look at the rest of it. They, uh, we see that uh, uh, he had let his so in John chapter eighteen. Turn with me to John chapter eighteen. Verse 22, it says, And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? So he, he had allowed, he had, he had, before he had allowed, Annas had allowed his, his soldiers to physically uh, assault Jesus in the temple court, and now he's allowing one of his soldiers to smite Jesus with the palm of his hand. And so the only reason Annas, they, they brought first, Jesus first to Annas' house, uh, and uh, the reason, the reason he brought them there, if you read this passage in John chapter 18, Annas wants to know about the disciples. Where, what are, the, where are the disciples? He wants to, to be able to take action against them. His purpose was not to find justice. And so then the second uh, part of this Jewish trial, he was then afterwards taken to the Sanhedrin in the temple with Caiaphas. And uh, this was this was Annas's, as I said, Annas's son-in-law. Now Annas had five sons who later became high priests. He was really powerful. 
And so just like, he, just like him, his son-in-law had the same idea, wanting to kill. And it was Caiaphas in chapter 11. He was the one who had said, let's kill him. Let's kill him. He had even, even prophesied in John chapter 11 that he was going to, to uh, let Jesus die so that the Romans wouldn't come down on all of them. And so this trial wasn't fair in any way. He was, Caiaphas also was far from in, in, impartial. And we read in Matthew chapter 26, we read it at the beginning, we read in verse 67 that, uh, that the, uh, the, who the prosecution was. The prosecution was uh, these lying witnesses. The, uh, the prosecution was um, uh, the Sanhedrin, actually. The, the, the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was made up of Jewish leaders, and this was the same council that had met in chapter 11 who had said that they were determined to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus was standing there in the, in the dead of night. Of course, Nicodemus was part of the Sanhedrin, but I doubt he would have... Uh, they probably wouldn't have called on him because they probably knew that he, he liked Jesus. And so there we go. There, there's the, uh, the prosecution. And then we see the evidence. What was the evidence? They searched and searched for evidence all into the night, but the Bible says they couldn't find any witnesses who, uh, whose stories matched. The Bible says in the Old Testament they had to find at least two witnesses who agreed. But there was so much lying going on, the only evidence was false witnesses. There was so much lying going on. There's a, that's a picture of uh, somebody with their hands, their fingers crossed behind their back. <laughs> so uh, saying, you know, you don't ha I don't have to tell the truth, because they had been paid. They'd been paid, the Bible tells us, to lie. And so these lying witnesses were found. They... They found people, they paid them, who were willing to lie, willing to misquote the words of the Lord. They had no case against them. They had to find two witnesses. And then finally they found two people who, who both said, they heard him say, that he would destroy his temp the temple. But he, of course, when Jesus said that, he was talking about, I, he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. Talking about his body. And so, uh, the witnesses were corrupt. The witnesses had been paid. The trial wasn't fair. Now what about the defense? The defense for this trial was totally missing. They had nobody defending the Lord Jesus Christ. And just as Isaiah had prophesied so many years before, the Lord Jesus opened not his mouth. He, he was as a lamb before his shears and as dumb and opened not his mouth as Isaiah said. There was no defense whatsoever. <laughs> So, they finally had to come up with a charge. As I said, that was supposed to be the first thing, but this is their, the last thing on, the, uh, on their mind. What is the charge going to be? As we read in Matthew chapter 26, the, uh, the charge against the Lord Jesus, they couldn't find anything else, so the Bible says that they came up with the charge of blasphemy. Blasphemy. Matthew chapter 26. And in verse 65, then the, then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? They got rid of all the witnesses. Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. So here we, we come up, they come up with uh, the fact that since he has declared himself to be the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, they, they couldn't imagine that that was true. So did Jesus deny that he was the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah? Did he deny the charge, the charge here at the top? No, Jesus didn't deny the charge. Why not? Because it was true. Jesus was <coughs> the Son of God. He was the Christ. He was the Messiah. And so uh, uh, these, these men... They were so filled with envy, with prejudice, with hatred, so intensely that they had shut their ears to all the evidence. There is so much evidence that G Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is God. And uh, He had done so many miracles to prove that He was the one who had come to reverse the curse. He had, he had uh, all the claims of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, was, he had raised the dead. He had caused the blind to see. He had been born miraculously without a sinful nature. Uh, a, a virgin birth, and yet, uh, yet these 
blind people blinded by envy. They had shut their ears, shut their eyes to every single miracle because instead of admitting their own guilt, they were guilty of committing the only impardonable blasphemy in the world, and that is rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only unpardonable sin. Blaspheming the Holy Ghost, blasphemy, and uh, not al allowing the Holy Ghost to point you to the Savior. And so when Jesus calls himself the Son of God, the Lamb which taketh away the sin of the world, how do you respond? Do you, do you reject those claims? Do you close your ears? Do you close your eyes to, this, to all the signs, to all of the, the, the facts? Or do you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, they, they didn't. And so if you don't put your faith in Jesus, you were there on that day. You, you, were, you were guilty. Who killed Jesus? Was it the Jewish men? No, we're just as guilty if we don't put our faith in Jesus. The sentence was death. And that's what we see in the next verse. They said all together, uh, What think ye? And they answered and said, verse 66, He is guilty of death. They rushed through the farce of a trial. They, uh, the high priest moved to the verdict, What think ye? And uh, think of how these evil men were so pleased with themselves. The crowds awoke the next morning and they discovered that while they were sleeping, Jesus had not only been arrested, he'd been tried, and the verdict had been sealed. There were no appeals. The sentence was death. The only problem was the Jewish leaders, they had no power to execute a death sentence. Uh, that was something only a Roman governor could do. Because remember, they were under Roman rule. And uh, they, so they rushed the prisoner early in the morning. Uh, they rushed the prisoner early to the judgment hall of Pilate at the earliest light. And in the meantime, they tortured him some more and beat him some more. Beat him with rods. And so that's, that's what, uh, where we come now to the second amazing trial that we see. The Roman trial. Now this Roman trial... This Roman trial was uh, going to be just as unfair as, uh, as this one. The, the uh, defendant is the same, the, the accused, the Lord Jesus Christ. But now let's look here together at Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, verse 1. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him and led them away, yeah. led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. You know, there's so many examples of the fact that Jesus was innocent. And Pilate as well, he's going to say, I, I find no fault in this, uh, in this man. And in just a moment, we're going to see what Pilate's wife has to say as well. So in the early, if you were there in, the, in Jerusalem on the streets in the early hours of the morning, you would have seen them uh, surround, a, a group of soldiers surrounding Jesus, leading him away to Pilate in a rushed way. And so, look down there at verse number 11. Then, G and it says, And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered, Nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not the thing, uh, how many things they witness against thee? He answered him never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Now at the feast, the governor was wont to release unto the prisoner, uh, the people a prisoner whom they would, and they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, so this is uh, this is after he's already been to Herod and back. Uh, there's a, 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 high, a parenthesis there. It says, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that, the, that for envy they had delivered him. 
When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this night in a dream because of him. So they have to obtain a death warrant. They're so frustrated. They, they've sentenced him, but they can't administer the verdict. And so they've, they've done the, the, the crime of blasphemy. So now they have to come up with a new charge because the Romans don't care about the charge of blasphemy. So they come up with a new charge. The new charge now that they tell um, Her uh, Pilate is he's guilty of treason. He wants to take over the Roman government. He's called himself a king. He's talked about his kingdom. Uh, and look, uh, of course, the, all throughout the, uh, the, the gospel records, Jesus, Jesus was, was telling people, my kingdom's not of this world. In fact, one time in John chapter 6, uh, they, the people had tried to make him a king, and yet he left them to go up on the mountain. And he told Pilate the same thing, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, but my kingdom is not of this world. And so the, 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 the charge was was empty. There was no treason committed. And Pilate saw that the charge was empty. He said, these people are just delivering this man to me because of envy. So Pilate knew that there was nothing in this, this case. He should have thrown it out of court. And, uh, and yet he didn't. He, he, um, he, 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 he was bound to take a, a charge of treason very seriously. But uh, it was ridiculous for them to, to accuse him of that. And so the charge, he asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, um, he said, thou sayest. As we saw there in verse number 11, thou sayest. You know, in one sense, Jesus is the king of the Jews. But not in the sense that, that uh, they were saying he was the king. They wanted to be the physical king right then and there. But he wasn't the physical king. He would be a future king. His kingdom was not of this world at that time, he said. And so, uh, besides that, Pilate, he realized that the Lord was no uh, violent criminal, no revolutionary, no murderer, like, the, like Barabbas, the other man that he saw. He saw through all these false charges, but, but Jesus was refusing to answer all these ridiculous false charges. They didn't, they didn't merit an answer. And again, just as Isaiah had prophesied 700 years before in Isaiah 53, the Lord opened not his mouth. So his plan was to shame the Jewish leaders, find a legal loophole. He said, I'm going to get out of this, but that was refused by the Jewish leaders. His wife warned him uh, not to have anything to do with this just man. And uh, Pilate uh, got this guidance from his, his really um, agitated wife. She was agitated by this dream, but... What did Pilate do? It's amazing. Pilate had the whole Roman Empire behind him. He had these soldiers surrounding him. And yet, what did he do? He caved in to these. He, he was scared of these Jewish leaders. And uh, he, he uh, publicly acknowledged the man to be innocent. He says, why, what evil hath he done? So here we see that, I, I forgot to put Pontius Pilate here. He's the new judge. The, uh, again, the defense is missing. There's no defense for the Lord Jesus Christ, except for maybe his uh, uh, Pilate's wife. She came to his defense. And uh, we see that uh, the, the only evidence that uh, Pilate had was the fact that there was a howling mob wanting to have him killed. The crowds shouting, crucify him. The only prosecution was these same men who wanted him to be killed. And so the Lord Jesus Christ was sentenced. He was, he was charged. Uh, his, his, uh, his verdict, all, all uh, Pilate could say was, what evil has he done? Nothing. That's the only verdict he said. But, but what, what, so he said, what should I do with Jesus then, who is called Christ? Now that is the question. For all of the ages, what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? The world said, "Crucify him," and that was the verdict. And that was the that was the um, the sentence. So the Roman sentence said, "Crucify him." 
Now, you may not have been there on that day, but what would have you? What would you have said if you were in that crowd? We're all sinners. We're all. We're all. Uh, we. Uh, we're all part of this crowd. We're. We're all guilty of sin. They treated the Lord cru cruelly. They. Uh, they sent him to be whipped. Uh, Pilate uh, washed his hands. He says in John chapter nineteen, verse twelve. It says, Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus. 19 verse 12, I'm sorry. <coughs> Actually, let's start reading at verse 6. We haven't read that part yet. It says, When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him. By the way, the title of this painting here is called Behold the Man. And that's that famous phrase is found in verse 5. It says, Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said unto them, Behold the Man. When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. And the Jews answered him, We have a law... And by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave no answer. Isaiah 53, 7. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have the power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except that it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from, there, and from, uh, from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, if, if thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in the place that was called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And so it says, and it, and it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. And they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, We have no king. But Caesar. They've been waiting for their king for 2,000 years, and yet now he's there, and they say, we have no king but Caesar. So the Bible tells us that that's the greatest question. What then shall I do with Jesus, which is called Christ? He, he had him whipped with leather uh, strips, the, the cat of nine tails. Just think about those pieces of bone and metal that ripped through his flesh. So many other criminals died just from the scourging because the wounds could be so deep and so severe. Now, who was responsible for all this dreadful, uh, this dreadful trial, this dreadful pain, this dreadful suffering? The Bible says that the Lord Jesus Christ, He is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We all have suffering, we all have grief, but who, He's acquainted with grief, but who was responsible for all of these things? Well, was it the Romans? Was it the Jews? Was it Pilate? Was it Caiaphas? Who was responsible? You know, who was it? It was, it was the crowds, really, uh, you could say. It was the crowds. They, 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 Pilate tried to get up, but the crowds cried out and made him do it. But they were responsible for his pain and for his death. The religious leaders, Pilate, the people, uh, just one week before, they had been crying, Hosanna, the son of David. But, but people can so easily be swayed by, by evil men and worked up into, uh, in, into uh, God gossip and false lies about someone. And so, uh, they, he had not set up the kingdom in that week. He had been just teaching in the temple. But the Lord went willingly. Uh, you know, uh, are you among the people who are ashamed of Jesus? Pilate, the, the, the religious leaders, they they had planned and schemed against the Lord. Now, there's so many people out there like Pilate, like the, like the religious leaders. There's people out there who fight against Jesus' teaching. They believe they can manage without God. They refuse 
uh, him any of their obedience or any of their time. They, they ridicule all the warnings that we give them about hell, just as the religious leaders ridiculed all the warnings that he gave them about hell. They condemn, they condemned Jesus' rules and code of morals, just like people condemn uh, uh, the Bible's uh, rules and regulations. And they whip themselves up into hostile. There's so many people out there, they whip themselves up into being hostile against Jesus. And uh, one, But one day, as we're going to see in a moment, Jesus will be the judge. Pilate, he, was, he knew Jesus was innocent, and there's many people like that. They know Jesus is a good man, but they're easily swayed by position and power. And they're easily swayed by what people think. They want to be respected. There's people who are too smart to believe in Jesus, aren't they? And there's so many people who are reluctant to want to give up their Sundays and learn more about the Savior. There's so many people who, who uh, they think they'll get made fun of and scoffed if they believe in their, their, their cowards and they just give up. There's so many pilots in our day as well. And then we've got the, the crowd, the crowd over here, the, the, the howling mob. And you know, there's so many people just like them. They're easily swayed. And, uh, uh, you know, they allow themselves to, to uh, be ashamed of the Lord Jesus. Even though they had just been shouting his praises a week before, Peter, in his sermon in Acts chapter 2, he said to these people, he said, it, it wasn't Pilate who killed Jesus. It wasn't the Jews who killed Jesus. But he says in Acts chapter 2, verse 23, to the people, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain him. So even though it was the, Jew, the Romans who actually hammered those nails, he said to the people, it was your wicked hands that crucified him. Now we can't get out of that either. It was our wicked hands that crucified him. It was my hands that drove the nails. It was my hands that beat the hammer. It was my sins that caused Jesus to go to that cross. Every time I sin, it drives another... Uh, it drives another a uh, uh, hit on the hammer into the Lord Jesus Christ, pain and suffering that he went through on that day. And yet the Lord Jesus, he went willingly. He said in John chapter 10, verse 18, No man taketh my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. In Luke chapter 22, verse 19, which we'll celebrate next week, he said, This is my body which is broken for you. It's given for you. He gave himself. He could have called a whole legion of angels, uh, uh, 12 legions, he said. 12 legions of angels is 72,000 angels. That's how many angels were standing in the wings waiting to help the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, he stood there and, uh, and he took it all. Now, we have just a couple uh, seconds left. We, we're just a couple minutes left. But I want to not forget that there's going to be a final judgment, a third judgment, a third amazing trial. And this is what I'm coming towards. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, one day, these people, Pilate, they and, uh, and the, the, the Jews, they are going to be the accused. And the Lord Jesus Christ, he is going to be the judge. You know, he's going to be standing in that judgment seat. When is this going to happen? It's going to happen, the Bible says... At the end of time, after Christ's coming, after his millennial reign is finished, the Bible tells us that, uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ will be, will be uh, judging every single one. The Bible says he's going to come back one day. And look at, if you will, with me at read the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So the Lord Jesus Christ will be there, but you know what? Every single one of us, who have, every single person who has ever trusted Christ, will stand there on that day. In the, in the judgment seat with these accused. We'll all be there. Uh, if, unless, you've, unless you've been acquitted. Unless you've been forgiven. And so this, uh, this, this trial in the future. The Son of God will return to the earth. In all of His glory and all of His majesty. It will be the greatest trial in history. The final judgment of all people. 
and uh, just think about how, how the roles will finally be reversed. Look, if you will, again at, at Matthew, where we started. We'll start with, we'll end with where we started. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 64. This is Caiaphas. He said that this day was going to come. He says, Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Jesus is going to come. He had predicted this to Caiaphas. One day it's going to happen. The one, who, the ones who pierced him, who's going to be the judge? He's going to be a perfect judge. He's going to be a good judge. He's going to be an impartial judge. He, he, he was so maligned by these two judges, Annas and Caiaphas. He was so uh, looked over by, by, uh, by the, the judge Pontius Pilate. But he has been appointed by God the Father as the judge of all the world as it says in Acts chapter 17, verse 31. Acts 17, 31 says, God the Father has appointed him to be everyone's judge. Acts 17, 31. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man who he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. So the one who raised from the dead, he's the man. He's the one who will, be a, who will judge the world in righteousness. This will be a perfect judgment. It's going to be an open trial, unlike the trials of Jesus held at night in secret, so that nobody can see what happened. This trial of sin is going to happen in the open, as Mark 4.22 tells us. And, uh, you know, everyone will have an opportunity to defend themselves, to talk to, to, to uh, everyone's going to have an opportunity to answer for themselves individually. They'll stand before the Lord <coughs> Jesus Christ. And yet, I don't believe that anyone will have any excuse. No. The Bible tells us in Matthew 22, verse 12, Matthew 22, 12, that we'll be speechless before the Lord. The Bible says that, in Romans chapter 1, it says that, uh, that everyone will be without excuse. Matthew 22, verse 12 says, And he saith unto them, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. See, he says there, Friend, how camest thou in? He gives them a chance. And yet they will be speechless. It's going to be an open trial. It's going to be a fair trial. It's not going to be based on on uh, false witnesses or anything biased, but it's going to be based upon God's law. God's law, which has been given to all the world in the Word of God, and it's written on people's hearts, in their consciences. It's going to be a fair trial. The Bible says that uh, the evidence will be opened, the books will be opened, the Bible says. There's going to be many books opened, Everything will, will have been recorded just right. There will be nothing, uh, nothing, uh, the facts were recorded by God himself. The book of Daniel chapter 7 talks about this. And also the book of Revelation chapter 20 verse 12. It says, and I saw the dead. So let's, let's read verse 11 as well. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, for there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. You know, Caiaphas and Annas, they've been waiting in hell for this day. And it's finally going, to, finally going to be lifted up out of hell. After the devil's been put into the castle lake of fire, this great white throne judgment is going to happen. And the Bible says that they're going to be lifted up for one last time. Imagine what, the, what thoughts in their mind is, as they come up out of hell. It says, and they were judged every man according to their works. And then the Bible says the sentence, what the sentence was going to be. The charge here is sin. The verdict is we're all guilty. Every single one of us. The sentence is death. And the next verse tells us that sentence 
It says in verse 14, And death and hell was, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the Lamb's, written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. That's the, that's the sentence. But you know what? In verse 15, there's hope, isn't there? There's a book of life. There's people whose names have been acquitted. There's people who have been forgiven. You know, the Savior, he encountered nothing. There was no hope, nothing but hatred and antagonism when he was tried. And so many guilty people will never have to go through this trial at the end of time, though, because the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord will, the Lord will be their defense. You know, you'll be speechless. Unless the Lord Jesus Christ comes down, the, the Lord Jesus Christ stepped down out of heaven, He came down to the earth, He died for you, so that He could be your advocate, so that He could be your defense. And the Lord Jesus Christ can give you forgiveness. And He can give you all, He, he died the just for the unjust. He paid, as 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18 says, you know, He's the just judge dying for the unjust sinner. That's what he did for you. You know, there was a man once who was sitting in prison, and uh, he was been put in prison by Henry VIII, and he was going to be killed, and he was so discouraged that he just sat there, and he wouldn't open any of his post, and uh, he, got a, he got lots of letters, and he just let them sit there, and then the day of his execution came, the sentence had been made, and uh, he went out to be beheaded, and then he was killed, and then they went to his jail cell, and they went through his things, and they opened up one of those letters, and one of those letters had been a, an official pardon from the king. Mm -hmm. And yet he never had opened it. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, he has come down. He has, wants to call you friend. He wants to take your defense. He's given you a pardon. Will you open that letter? Will you open that, that, uh, that pardon? Will you receive the gift of eternal life that the Lord Jesus has offered to you? Let your name be found written in the Lamb's book of life. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the amazing humility of the Lord Jesus Christ and that he gave his life for us. Father, I pray that you'll help every person here to not, not waste the opportunity that the Lord Jesus is giving them to have full pardon, for, to, have, to become righteous just like, just like the Lord Jesus Christ died for us. He was the just, we were the unjust, but he died in our place. Father, I pray that every single person here will consider the great day of judgment when we all will stand before Him. Father, may He be there, our Savior, our friend, our, our, uh, instead of our judge, instead of the one before whom we tremble, and uh, with all the others who pierced Him. Father, we, we know that Caiaphas and Annas and Pilate will be trembling in their boots on that day. Help us not to be trembling. I pray that every person here will have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in His wonderful, powerful name that we pray. Amen. We're going to sing, Jesus paid it all, page 125. All to Him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Page 125.